This episode is sponsored by Embecta. Formerly known as BD Diabetes Care, Embecta is now a standalone company solely focused on serving the diabetes community. They are partnering with diabetics doing things to help bring awareness to diabetes stigma by sharing stories from people living with diabetes like the one you're about to hear on this episode. Whether you're a person who has diabetes or you're helping someone else manage it, Embecta wants to empower people to live a life unlimited by diabetes through innovative products and educational resources. You can learn more at www.embecta.com. That's E-M-B-E-C-T-A dot com. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very excited to present this episode with Dex Gerald. He's been on the podcast before. He's become a good friend of mine on social media and really digs into not only the misdiagnosis around his original type 2 diagnosis, but living with LADA and type 1 diabetes and how his life and his management has changed as a result. But also just talking about life. And uh, towards the end of the conversation, we talk about fashion. We talk about what's on both of our dopamine menus. And this was one of the best conversations I've had recently with a really great guy. And I'm excited to present this episode with the great Dex Gerald's. Enjoy. Welcome back to another episode of Diabetics Doing Things. We're telling the amazing stories of people with diabetes from all over the world. Returning to the podcast, my very special guest, you guys know him on social media, Dex Gerald's uh, fitness trainer, person with type 1 diabetes. You've been on the pod before, but this was before your re-diagnosis. So I'm excited to kind of dig into some of that as well today. But welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you for having me, having me again. I'm excited for the conversation. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, was it been like two, three years since, since I was on the pod? So yeah, yeah no, I'm really excited been- to get back into it. I think even longer than that, maybe. So yeah, it's it's been, uh, man, time flies when you're having fun. So I uh, yeah, man. So I, I guess like just for those who maybe are newer listeners and haven't gotten back to that episode, you were sort of this, like in, in the diabetes community, your story was kind of singular. You were like the fittest guy was type two diabetes. That was kind of like the, you know, early on, that's kind of how we got introduced. So now after a re-diagnosis of, of LADA and, and living with type one, like let's like, what, how has your life with diabetes changed since that time? Well, since that time it's, it's changed a lot. Like, like even, even today, like before, before I started using insulin to help control my diabetes, you know, I go on walks all the time. I do a massive amount of cardio to try to keep my blood sugar down. And now it's like, I go on a walk for one mile and my blood sugar drops. And now I got to make sure I have snack tandy. Like I got to be prepared for anything when I'm anywhere and balancing my blood sugar with that is it's been easier now that I have a way to treat it, but also it's kind of been harder too. like the activity level that I used to do is it's changed a lot. Like sometimes I have to stop and I, you know, I drink a Gatorade or I used to go travel and go on these hikes and, and now it's. I have to think about certain things, time of the day, of, am I going to be dehydrated and all this stuff. So it's a lot, a lot going into it. But at the end of the day, once I got the right diagnosis, like my blood sugar is controlled way better than it has been before. So, I mean, it's, it's been, it's been a blessing to uh, be able to manage my diabetes in a different way and improve my health. But also at the same time, it's, it's just a lot more thinking and should I do this or should I do that? Or maybe don't go on this walk today, or I have to wait a little bit before I can do something. And it hasn't really changed my relationships with people or anything like that, but it's definitely made it a little bit more difficult to plan out things. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I feel good, but the planning is a lot longer now. We had a guest on the podcast recently who was talking about he said he had read a stat. I haven't researched it yet, so I've got to I've got to like confirm it. But like the average person makes like has like forty to eighty thousand thoughts a day. So like even things that you're not even like really registering, like oh like that car is blue or like that house is brick or whatever the case. And people with diabetes often are double that. So like the amount of thinking you have to do just to plan out a hike or to go to a workout or even to go to sleep is just so much more than the average person. So yeah, I mean, I I think that, you know, when you add in that exogenous insulin and you're already really healthy and we're managing like your fitness and your health and your lifestyle, like super well, like that, that throws a lot of curveballs, man. It's like that only constant has changed. Yeah, that was, it's, 
it's still a learning curve that I'm I'm trying to deal with now. And like, I'm like, I've learned certain things to do and so I don't have to take so much insulin. Like I love pho and a lot of it is rice, like rice noodles or rice paper when I'm having the spring rolls. So now like certain things, like I eat that and then I just go on a long walk. And I know like it's going to spike me a little bit, but if I keep that walk, well, it's going to go up. But if I keep that walk steady to like a mile, a mile and a half, I can enjoy that and not have to worry about going too low from taking insulin to eat. So that's like playing around with stuff like that has been a major thing. I love donuts. And every time I go to the beach, I get a donut and then I skate the boardwalk from Santa Monica to Venice. And, and that like helps out a lot when, when I'm trying not to take too much insulin. I still haven't figured it out. I mean, I know it's like what one unit insulin per 15 carbs or something like that, but I don't know. Everybody's different. So yeah. Oh, be... most, yeah. So that's what it was for me. Maybe I need to play around with it, but yeah, sometimes that just, it just doesn't work. I mean, like it makes me go low super fast. And I know like with muscle mass and stuff like that, your body processes it a lot, a lot faster. Yeah. Like. Diabetes is hard, already had type two or type one, but I'd never imagined that. How many years has it been now? Four, four years, three or four years since I was historically diagnosed and I'm still trying to figure out what's the best way for me to manage my diabetes. And I, I think it's really relatable though, because like you are a person who is really in tune with your body. You're obviously, you know, a, a strength trainer, a personal trainer. So you're helping other people with their fitness as well. You're working out more than the average person. I love that you're talking about walks because, you know, something that we've been talking about a lot on the podcast is, you know, all these like Stanford and Harvard scientists are like studying like the secrets to living longer and like being healthy. And like, turns out it's just like sunlight and walking. And so... <laughs> It's just like, oh, like, could it be that easy? And, you know, in many ways, like for us with diabetes, we know, okay, I'm going to have a high carb, high fat meal, like a donut, like delicious. If I pair that with skating up and down the boardwalk, I can keep my numbers a whole lot cleaner than if I go sit down. That's one thing for me, like, you know, most of my life in my professional life is spent sitting down like I am, like I am right now. So if I go have like a really indulgent high carb meal, and then I'm going to sit down for three hours. Like my sugars compared to if I went on a walk or I was like out moving around or, or, you know, to get a workout in, they're so different. And it's just amazing how like the body can like in movement and activity can just help your life with diabetes. So much, it helps us so much better. And like the crazy thing it's that I ever thought about as a person living with diabetes is the neighborhood that I choose to live in. If, if it's not walkable, like I can't live there because I don't want to like sit down after I eat. I want to be able to go all the way off and help control my blood sugar in a certain way. And that's like one of the things like people who have functional pancreas is the thing I'll ever have to think about is I need a walkable place because it helps me control my blood sugar better versus someone who just eats dinner and then they throw on Netflix and can chill for the rest of the day and feel just fine. I want to, I want to double click on that for a minute, because I think in a lot of ways, because like those things are like the blood sugar, like glucose excursions are happening for people who don't have diabetes. Right. And their pancreas just like adjusts and like gives them, gives them insulin quick and you know, absorbs it quicker than, than our bodies do. But like, they don't know that's happening for the most part. Like there's no awareness because they don't have the number. They're not doing the math. And so like in a lot of ways that burden can be an advantage like early on you're like oh well if i eat a big dinner and then i sit down you know i see how my body responds differently to that than you know if i ate a different chose a different meal or if i had an activity after early on in my life with diabetes i remember like going to be, like to basketball camp and like at sports camp you're playing sports all day long so i remember i would only use basal insulin during those sport camp weeks and i would eat and drink a ton of gatorade and like eat a ton of carbs but my body was just like processing so much and I was burning so many calories. I was also like honeymooning at that point as well. So like I was still probably making a little bit of insulin, but I just remember like it was, it was a really like eye opening moment for me of like, oh, well, in some cases, like if I'm the more active I am, the better I process carbs and like the better I absorb insulin, like this could be a nice, like, you know, a nice mix for me compared to when I'm sitting down all day or when I'm on like a plane or I'm in a meeting and, you know, we've got like, every plain meal is like the highest carb 
ratio possible. Right. I don't know. It's like they just rig it up that way. So it's like, I'm going to like, oh man, I got to dose like way more insulin because I'm just going to be sitting here for the next couple hours because they typically frown upon people doing lunges up and down the, the <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. we got to change that. We got to change that. But so I guess like, you know, I don't know you, you're, you're a trainer. So you're training people with diabetes, but also without diabetes. So I guess like, how do you like, what kind of baseline knowledge like does a typical client come to you with from like a fitness perspective? I know it like it it's I've learned over the years that a lot of people don't know much about fitness whatsoever. They don't know much about dieting or like the right food to eat. So I do find that people living with diabetes tend to have a little bit more knowledge just from research about how their body like processes process things and what you should eat to gain muscle or how you should eat to lose fat compared to my clients who've never had any issues with or chronic illnesses or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, I think part of the reason why I'm still employed is, is even though the internet they give you tons of information, like sometimes they give you a lot of bad information and a lot of people come to me confused about what they hear. Like I always get Oh, I see it on TikTok that if you do 100 pushups a day and that's all you have to do, you don't have to do anything else and you'll get strong or something like that. Well, kind of, but there's more to it than that. So yeah, I mean, yeah. So like the people I know with any chronic illnesses, like I work with other people who, who aren't just diabetic, but have other issues with their body as well. They always seem to be a little bit more in tune with their body because you have to versus the people who are, and I don't want to say healthy or something like that, but no, the people like who no don't have, yeah, exactly. No reason they don't have to deal with that. So the, their knowledge level isn't up to speed as the, someone living with a chronic illness. It's interesting to kind of frame it that way as a, as a gift to like what's going on in your body and like more being more in tune and more intuitive. I know it's not the same for everyone and like it, it can be obviously extremely challenging and heavy. And we've talked a lot about diabetes, distress on the podcast. But, you know, for people, again, when I read stats, like eight out of 10 people with prediabetes don't even know that they have it because they, you know, for one reason or another, you know, don't, don't need to, or their doctor hasn't given them any information or they haven't been going or, or whatever the case may be, you know, that diagnosis can be a, a real gift, like early on in your life, in many cases, learning about like inputs and outputs and how things are, are, you know, happening inside your body. You talked about some like misinformation on the internet. So like there's, you know, back in the day that you like, don't believe you ever, everything you read on the internet. It's like, now it's like, don't believe everything you hear on TikTok, no matter how good it sounds. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about some misconceptions about fitness and diabetes, because I I've seen a lot that people are worried about like that they can't gain muscle on diabetes. So they can't lose weight if they're taking insulin. So I'd, I'd love to hear your perspective on some of those common questions you get from people with diabetes who are getting into fitness or are maybe getting a trainer for the first time and some of the questions that they have. Yeah. Like I think one of the biggest misconceptions about living with diabetes and getting muscles is insulin actually is a growth hormone and it helps you gain muscle. So like, I don't know where that really came from other than the fact that living with diabetes, it is harder to work out because you have to manage your blood sugars in a different way, but with all the diabetics that I work with, we've never had a single issue with um, gaining muscle. And mostly it's because your diet, you should be eating one gram of protein per pound if you want to gain muscle. And protein's great because it doesn't affect us as much as like carbs does. And it also is, it takes the longest to, for your body to break down. So it speeds up your me metabolism too. So you're getting benefits of adding muscle and losing fat at the same time. So. I don't, I don't know where that came from with the whole diabetes, people living with diabetes can't gain muscle. So what was the other one? Comes up? The other one I think is on, is on weight because, you know, I think you, oh, you're okay. right. Insulin is a growth hormone. And so you, it does make it like easier metabolically to gain muscle sometimes. But I think also people associate it with gaining weight. And so like losing weight with diabetes can be hard, I think. And I think especially with women with diabetes, there's so many like body issues and misinformation and, and bad, like toxic diet culture out there. I think a lot of that plays into it as well. Yeah, for sure. Especially, especially diet culture. Someone told me recently, like when you're eating like whole foods and you're eating like meat and you're not really eating processed stuff, 
people call that dieting, but that's actually how we should be eating for the most part. It's probably different for us because we need to get sugar from time to time. But if you still stay in a calorie deficit and you still work out just like a regular person, you can still lose weight. I think, I think the weight gain comes from the fact that again, it's just hard to work out as a diabetic. And I know for me, my diet changed a lot. Once I started taking insulin, there was things I would never touch when uh, I thought I was tight too, that I'm eating now. And I think that might be something that other people living with diabetes, uh, those things happen where you might start eating things that, uh, you'd never previously ate before. So that's going to be a bit, a little bit of weight gain. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think those factors can contribute to weight gain, but I think if you still, well, I know if you still monitor what you're eating, what you put in your body, which I think most of us do as diabetics, we need to know how much carbs that we're actually eating. So that's something you just have to live with. And if you know how much protein you're putting in your body and how many calories you're eating per day with your activity level, you still can lose weight. I don't think it's too much of an issue. And I, I know tons of runners who have no issues with gaining weight at all. If anything, they're trying to gain weight because of all the, the fat they lose through their running. So yeah, it's just, we just have to be a little bit more diligent about it when you exercising is making sure you're in a good place and, and you'll, you'll lose weight. I think it's interesting. You, you talked about it's hard to work out with diabetes because it really is, but I also want to normalize for people with diabetes who are listening to this, who have been trying to exercise or working on or having obstacles or encountering obstacles when they're exercising. It's also hard for regular people to exercise. You know, there's, there's a reason that, you know, so many, a high percentage of people in America are overweight. Like our lifestyle today in 2024 is not as walkable. Like you were talking about is not as labor intensive. It's more sedentary. We're sitting down during the day at work. We're sitting down when we get home watching TV. And, you know, I had this guy that I worked with 10 or 12 years ago and he was like, you know, sitting is the new smoking. And he would always be like trying to do walking meetings. And he was really ahead of the curve. He was kind of, everybody kind of looked at him crazy at the <laughs> time, but you know, he was really all about like trying to not sit so much. And the only difference there is like, it just takes extra effort for people with diabetes and extra preparation because, you know, I'm sure you have, and you, you do a really great job of this through your content creation. So I want to talk about that a little bit too. But like, I, I want to normalize, like I, I also go to basketball games or go to the gym and I'll have a low blood sugar and I have to step out and drink a sweet drink or eat some gummy bears or something because every now and then, even the best preparation isn't the right thing. Right. And I like, especially living with diabetes, like we have to do extra prep anyway. So for me, it's just, it's just, I, like you said, I just try to normalize the fact that like when I work out. These things can happen. My blood sugar can go up from, from lifting too much heavy weight and it can go down if I'm doing too much steady cardio. So I just expect those things to happen and I'm fair for them. And there's going to be days where I feel lousy, but I'm going to feel better as long as I'm still going to the gym and being active and trying to do the things I can do that make my blood sugar more manageable. Well said. I think, you know, just understanding how your body reacts to different exercise too, and like having that kind of beginner's mind and like curious mind about it, because, you know, we're, we're adults. We don't necessarily, it's not like when we're like kids in high school or whatever here in the U S like you basically play one sport you're doing, like you have regular practices and those things. Like, I think it's really important for people to find a mix of things that they like to do, whether cardio or strength training, just to keep it interesting and entertaining. Right. Yeah, I tell my clients that all the time. Like, exercise shouldn't always feel difficult or hard. You shouldn't have to always force yourself to go somewhere and lift weights or anything like that. Like, if you can find something like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or like you know, a rollerblade or roller skate or something like that, that's activity that's only going to benefit you, your heart health, and all that stuff. Like, Never just go on the internet, see somebody you admire doing something and then you do it and you realize you hate it and you want to go through it every day. No, find something that, take your time and find something that's going to be useful for you and something you're excited to do all the time. I couldn't agree more. I think, and even as somebody like, who was a competitive athlete for, you know, many, most of my life, like even now learning about the longevity and like the impact that a small, like a short 
slow walk can have on your cardio capacity and like the impact of, you know, cardio zones and, you know, you don't have to go all out all the time to be a serious, you know, training person. So, you know, I think finding that balance to where you're doing something that is going to let you do something tomorrow and be interested right. in something tomorrow. I think that showing up is, and wanting to show up and feeling energized to do that will take you a lot further than, you know, burning yourself out over one thing. Exactly. So let's talk content creator because, you know, you're, you're a busy guy. You've, you've got your, you know, your personal life, you got your work life, your training clients, both in person and virtually, and you are living with diabetes and you're creating content about fitness in general and fitness and diabetes. Like, how do you, you know, how do you find the time like creatively to, to stimulate, stimulate yourself to create that content? In the past, it was, it was a little more easier. I'm doing pretty well with. My clientele now are like, at one point I had 15 private clients and I was still coaching like six CrossFit classes a week. Um, so now like with started with content creation, I usually try to find some time on the weekend, usually a Sunday after a client, I'll try to film a quick workout or I got some new stuff coming pretty soon that I've been playing around with. I think I finally get it right. That's more of fitness and diabetes together versus this one or the other. And yeah, like, I don't know. I felt burnt out at the beginning of the, of the year. When Let's it talk about it. Post the months, the internet, the internet gets to me sometimes with like a lot of the images I see, I don't want to see. And so I just won't even go to Instagram or TikTok and, and then I get on there and then you create something that doesn't give any views or, and like, do you really put time in? I'm like, I'm editing this video. Like this is a sick transition and all that. And then I got like eight likes, um, like a video I just posted recently yesterday has, does it have that many likes on it? And when it, which is fine, like as long as people are seeing the information and using it, that's what I get excited about, but. Oh, um, I think we all have that, that reward or that dopamine hit where you see those likes coming in or the comments and stuff like that. Uh, but now like as the year is starting to wrap up and starting to get more into content creation again and trying to be a little bit more diligent on answering messages and all that stuff. Like for a while, I just, I just didn't have the energy to do any of that. And now it's like, okay. Some people are reached out to me. They're asking me questions. I can make content that they're off these questions about diabetes and fitness and feel good about it because I'm actually helping someone do it. Man, I, I love this conversation because I have felt very similar. You know, like there's all in our life, we have this like seasonality, you know, in the U.S., right? We went to school. We have like back to school in August. And then there's like Thanksgiving break and Christmas break and then spring break and then summer break. And you have these like structured time periods where you kind of know that you're going to get time off or there's a, you know, there's finals week. So you're like studying really hard and then you kind of go away and it's all wrapped around school. Oh, uh, I lost you here. About that phone call. Yep, you're good. So as adults, like we don't really get that. And I think with content creation too, there's no like weekend. Everybody's checking the apps like every single day, all the time, you know? And right. so there, and I also think like, you know, you start to see things that you don't want to see. You're like, why am I seeing this? Or like, or this is making me feel a certain way. And, you know, when you really double click on it, it's like, oh, well, these apps are incentivized to really make us upset and, you know, and to keep us angry and to keep us like, you know, sick or, or whatever the case may be. And so you start to be like, well, man, I don't really want that. Like, what am I doing here? And so that burnout is real and I definitely feel it. And something that I have to credit my wife for because she's also a content creator and she was like, you know what? Like my rule is like, I just can't care about this. Like I can't get wrapped up because it's like every time I put like a lot of effort into a piece of content, it never like the, the, the return on like the user engagement is like never the same. But if I put like no effort into it at all, and I just like put some dumb little thing up, it like goes crazy. So right. you never, you never can really tell, but if you like relieve yourself of having that expectation that it's going to do something crazy, it like, I've found that it definitely helps me a little bit. Yeah. I like lately there's like, I've been doing fashion posts and like trying to get into like a little bit more things that I enjoy. I, did, I just don't want my page to be always focused on fitness and diabetes. So like sometimes when I get some of these other content creators and I'm like, I don't know how you can find so much 
things in your world that connect to diabetes. Like I don't, I don't always want to think about what I have to live with and then I don't want to have to post it all the time. I want to post myself having fun, doing other things. And that's been helping a lot with getting me back in the groove of, of posting regularly and, and making these videos and stuff. But yeah, like, like your wife said, like, I just post it and forget it for the most part. Unless there's comments and then, you know, I'll get right back on make this exactly, exactly. And I mean, I always try to give my best effort with anything I do. So another quality would be well, but yeah, they yeah, like if the likes aren't there, the likes aren't there, but the information is being received by someone. I do want to encourage you on that though, because I, I also have felt even more recently like asking bigger questions, like, am I doing the right thing? Like, is all this work like the right stuff? Because it takes effort, it takes time, it takes energy. Am I having an impact? And I had a couple of like really independent, I don't know, they weren't really signs, but they were like, you know, inquiries or comments or like people that I met or I encountered because of what I was doing. And none of them are going to like change my life, like, for, or, or like, you know, any kind of like material benefit, but it was, you know, one of them was like a kid in a small town in Louisiana who got diagnosed with diabetes and loves basketball and, and is in the foster care system. And somebody found like through diabetes and basketball or whatever kind of searching they were doing, they found me and I'm able to talk to them. So I just want to encourage you, like there will be, even, even though I, you're exactly right, the amount of people that create, can find things in their life to connect to diabetes or fitness or like anything else where they like really niche down. I admire people like that because it's hard. Um, yeah, but so like I can't. I tried and like, right? It's incredible the way they can. I mean, that's why you call call us content creators because they yeah. really are great at creating content centered around diabetes. But I, I will say, I, I'll tell you, like you continuing to do it will somebody somewhere at some point will find it, and it it could be like the difference in their in their life with diabetes or their life in general. So you know, I encourage you to keep doing what you do, and you do a great job. Thank you. In that same vein, though, I think you, you touched on something interesting, which is like, as creators, we kind of are known for like one or two things and people are like multifaceted and there's, there's a lot of different parts of them. So like for you exploring, whether it's fashion or it's anime or it's music, or like you're kind of like making uh, conversations about festivals a few weeks ago, like those are all things that you enjoy doing. So like as you're sharing and opening up those parts of your life with diabetes, like how, how does that come up for you? Yeah, so I like this past year at Coachella. For the last few years, I've been at Coachella. I went both weekends. I'm very blessed to have clients who work in the music industry, so I don't really pay for tickets all that much. Nice, uh, huge. But when I go to festivals, my blood sugar is perfect. Like the lines, just a little squiggly across, like like my pancreas works. It's probably because of all the walking and the dancing and all that stuff. And I wanted to create content based off of festivals, but when I'm there, I'm so into it. I don't ever really pull my phone out all that often to like actually do anything like that. So that's something, that's something I actually want to start trying to do when I'm at shows and concerts is trying to like connect how I control my blood sugar when I'm at those things. And then, yeah, like a lot of the other things that I really like skateboarding or longboarding has been big for me and my mental health as of the last three years. And I, I was telling you with like, I like to go eat donuts every now and then. So when I go to the beach, my favorite donut shop is over there. And um, it's called Sidecar Donuts for anybody in LA who wants to try it. I get the salt and butter and then I get to go straight to the border off and I'm going back and forth on my skateboard in Venice. And now that I'm talking about it with you, now I understand how these people are able to connect diabetes with whatever, whatever they're doing. Yeah. And, and I picked up the saxophone again after I think 18 years, somewhere, somewhere around there. So that's been pretty fun, like relearning how to create music and hopefully get back to the level of being able to play jazz music like I have been before. Um, and posting about that has like kind of got me back in the groove into trying to post more often and, and beating the algorithm and all that stuff and it takes to have your stuff pushed out by Instagram and TikTok and all that stuff. You got to feed the beast, man. It's so tough. I, it's interesting though, because like, you know, you're sharing this part of your life. Like it's, it's fun. You talked about, and, and I experienced this challenge as well. Cause like, I love to travel. And that was one of the, kind of the things like with my content, like I always felt more inspired to, to create content when I was going somewhere new. 
Um, but now kind of like you, I'm like, oh, I really want to focus on being in the moment and like experiencing this new place and like, you know, really enjoying it because that makes me feel good. But then it's like, oh, I went to this thing and I totally forgot to like make anything. Yeah, and it's, it's like opportunity you know, that. Yeah, people expect, or, you know, or like that's that will be good, would be good content. And it's like, oh, well, now I used to kind of beat myself up about it. And now I'm just like, oh, well, like we'll do something else another time. Like, and, you know, at least the got the most important part right, which is just to enjoy it. Exactly. Uh, but I like, I forget who I was talking to, another person with diabetes. And I'm going to go to Coachella and every person I see with a CGM, I'm going to take a picture or a video with them, then sing a CEO's. Didn't see a single person with a CGO this past year, Coachella. The year before that, when I wasn't even thinking about that, every every person I went to go see, there was someone there with a CGO. And I'm like, oh, that's crazy. The fact that now I want to put effort into it, there's, I can't find a single person. You like reverse uh, manifested it. It just like, exactly. The whole week too. I'm going to a festival in San Francisco at the end of September. So hopefully I can put that to use there. Yeah, man, I think there's, like you were talking about, like finding the flat line, like being outside, dancing, like also having fun. I have this weird, like, I'm not, I'm never really focused on my blood sugars when I'm doing something I really love to do. And I think as a result, sometimes just that alignment you get, if you're out doing what you love to do, you're really focused on it. Like everything else kind of just works out. And right. if your sugars aren't exactly perfect, you're not really tied up with that. So I think that's always a, a really interesting concept. Thanks, Ty. All right. So. You have a very unique perspective because you were, you know, very out in the community as a person living with type two diabetes and, and then the rediagnosis. We had Mila Clark on the podcast who also went through a similar rediagnosis. Yeah. I love Mila. She's awesome. It's just an A1 friend of the pod since, since man, way back. And like we talk, we're talking about stigma. What do you wish like more people knew about diabetes? Because you are also encountering a lot of people like in the algorithm, I'm sure in the fitness world who don't live with diabetes and have like their own preconceived notions about diabetes. But like for you, like, what do you wish more people knew? I wish people knew like how much of genetics come into play when people are diagnosed with diabetes, not even just type one, but type two as well. Like I have a client, he's from the Netherlands, uh, Amsterdam and, and you would look at him and think he's super fit, but right now she, he's pre-diabetic and mostly because his family has had diabetes throughout the years. So like your, your, your genetic blueprint changes over time when, when family member after family member has diabetes. And then a lot of times I get on the internet and I know I see on the podcast about fitness and stuff and these people get it wrong. They always, they're always talking about like these, these, the factors of not exercising and and eating healthily, obviously for anybody, those things can change your body and, and, or have, have a negative impact on your body. But there's some people who do all those things all the time and still they can't escape their fate because it's imprinted in their DNA. So like, I wish people would take the time to actually like listen to someone who, who has type two diabetes or who are overweight or something like that. And, and learn that it's not always because they're amazing. That's how they get it. And there's, there's other factors, environment. Some people don't have access to high quality food. So they do what they can. They eat whatever is in the area, which isn't always good. I think they call it a food desert to something yep. like that, where all you have is like fast food and there's not very many grocery stores there and they carry really good high quality food. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's. I get where type one diabetics that I've met in the past get frustrated because they'll talk to someone about diabetes and that person only knows about type two. And then they'll say something about their diet and stuff like that. And I can get the frustration with that. But I think if that ever comes up in conversation, just educate the person. So when they have another conversation with the person lived with diabetes, they won't have to have the same response as you had because this person now knows what's going on with everyone's body. Yeah, I just, I just, we had a little bit more patience with each other to figure out these stigmas and have a little bit more empathy towards each other. And I, I think that'll go a long way with getting rid of some of these stigmas that surround diabetes. Man, you, you said it. I think, you know, just in general, the taking the time to really listen to someone is, is something we could all do a whole lot better to do. Not everything requires a response right away. And, you know, I think we're just so quick to try to, 
solve problems that aren't really ours to solve or, or offer opinions that aren't really ours to offer is that, and you know, we can just learn so much more from each other if we just listen. Exactly. I also want to touch on something. I mean, cause you, you talked about genetics, you talked about, uh, access to quality food and food deserts, something that we've seen. And I'd love your perspective on this. Cause we kind of touched on it earlier about knowledge of like fitness or working out or gaining muscle, but like health equity to me starts with information and access to information. And so many people like diabetes is super complex. And most of what the average person knows about diabetes is either misinformation or even, you know, related to stigma or like just jokes or things that they've heard. And it can be really hard to get them to the right information. And if you don't have a great relationship with your doctor or you don't have an endocrinologist because there's only 8,000 in the U S you know, you, you don't know where to go. And I think a lot of people, when they don't know what to do or they don't know where to go, they kind of just opt out and right. they say, well, like it must not be for me. This must just have to be the way that it is. So like, you know, for you, when you get clients who are coming to you and they don't know about fitness, like, do you, you know, you start with the basics, like, how do you, how do you get somebody who really has no baseline knowledge of, of exercise or the proper nutrition and diet? Like what's, what are the first steps that you take with a client like that? Yeah, so like for me, like we will have discussions about what a person should eat to be healthy, like what kind of movements they should do. Every every session is a learning experience, not only through movement, but through how to eat healthy. I never want to give too much information and people get frustrated with like the information overload. So it's always just these small steps to try to get them to a certain point. A lot of times, you know, changing your diet is hard especially when you ate a certain way for so long, your body gets these dopamine hits from whatever you're eating. And when you try to cut out certain things, it like craves that kind of like a drug. So with, with movement and dieting, it's just, we take our time, we do what we can. And then once that's good, then we do a little bit more and we do a little bit more and we do a little bit more and to the point where I like for my clients to go back to their family or their friends and discuss about what they just learned to someone else so they retain the information and then they're giving good information to somebody else as well. And hopefully, you know, through time and conversation, a lot of this misinformation that we have on the internet will change and people will know exactly what to look for and exactly what not to look for. Great advice. I, I think that starting small and like not getting the information overload is a great advice as well, just because there's so, so much you can do and it can be super overwhelming. And that's with fitness or with diabetes or what have you, like start small. And you've talked a lot about dopamine today. And so I kind of want to tap into that as well, because I also am a you know, recovering dopamine a fiend of like, you know, get, getting caught up in the, the burnout of like technology and, you know, really being intentional about like how I start my day so that I can feel better in my head, you know, struggling with mental health and. I had a post that went out today about mental health and my mental health checklist, which was cool. But I read this book called Dopamine Nation. And like, ultimately, like the takeaway was today, our, our brains are not wired for the abundance of today. Like we can literally think of something and order it and have it delivered. Somebody could be listening to this podcast and order sidecar donut and then have it delivered before the podcast is even over, over, right? over, right? And so for you, there's a trend right now on social media called like dopamine menu. So like the things that you have in your life that give you the dopamine that you want and like crave. What is on Dex Gerald dopamine menu? It's definitely live shows, content. Like I get, I get so excited about shows and I mean, there's a point in my life where I was going to two or three shows a week. I definitely calmed down a little bit. That's like one big thing food wise. Talked about it a little, a little bit earlier, but I love pho. I love it so much and you know, look, all the starch is probably not always the best, but I've learned how to eat it and not have, have that issue being at the beach. That's probably the biggest dopamine hit I could get. I worked at an event, I worked at an event at the beach called Painkiller two weeks ago. I think I was out there for eight or nine hours and one day I woke up and I felt so great. Like, I don't know, I'm not to be, get too personal. I feel like I'm always going through breakups, but I'm sure through a breakup earlier this summer and and like, it really messed with me like to the point where I went to a coffee shop last week and the barista said that I was like, it's nice to see you happy again. And well, that was right after the beat. Do you have to hear when you dunking on you like that? Yeah. And that's I didn't even realize like I was going through it like that hard, but, but yeah, the beast is definitely, that's probably the biggest over me. 
hit I could get. And if I'm there with my longboard or really gets me going. And if I'm outside all day, that's like the perfect situation for me to have my mental health where I want it to be. Hey man, sounds like on every, on every front, California is the right place for you, man. You got it all right there. And yeah, I mean, we can talk about it. I think it's, it's something that obviously like this podcast is not medical advice and we're not, you know, ad advising that, but I think finding the balance of, and I, and I think the reason that I really like this dopamine menu thing is because it looks different for everyone, but like if you had a day with all of those things you just mentioned in them, like how happy you, you would be if that happened, you know? And it's really simple. Like the, the things that give you the most dopamine in life are not these huge like peak experiences. And I think, or even like material possessions, like some pho, the beach, a show, a microdose, a, a skateboard, like, you yeah. know, like now that's like a pretty regular California day for most people. She shift after I didn't realize it until now, but yeah, it really is. I guess I would actually add shopping. Like I think you, you and I are both in the fashion. And oh, I am. Talk about it. Uh, put, we put that shit on, bro. That's, we, we, we have to do it. I think it's like the ultimate form of expression. Like it's the first thing people notice when, when you walk into any room or any situation of how, how you look. And, and then lately I just really been in the fashion. Like everything I watch on YouTube is about fashion. I know about all the fall trends already. Like what I'm going to buy soon. And it's got a cowboy hand. You know, like Let's things go. Like, things look like they good. Yeah. I don't have to go out to Texas sometime with that cowboy hat. Yeah, man. You know, everybody wears clothes. You know, so in a way, like you said, it's the, it's the ultimate form of individual expression. People look at you and talk to you differently based on like what, and think of you differently based on what you are wearing, you know? So what a cool thing to like, you know, get to think outside the box on. And I don't know, I, I'm really into like the classics and like and textiles and things lately. I'm basically like dressing like a grandpa, but I love it. It's, it's awesome, man. I'm just having a blast. What do they call that? There's like a, there's a term for that. Oh uh -huh. yeah. It might just be like norm core or something like that. Or just like, but I don't know. It's, I feel sort of geriatric, but like the other days, I, so like this summer I was shopping for like one of my favorite designers is Jerry Lorenzo from Fear of God. Fear of God, yeah. He did a collab a couple of years ago with uh, Zegna, with Emilio Zegna, the Italian fashion house, like amazing suits and like all this stuff. And you know, like it was, it was fear of God. It was like five grand for, for, a, yeah, just, I'm, like, I'm not, I'm like, you know, I'm not, not, not doing that well, but I was like, oh, I wonder if, because one of my really good friends is big into vintage and has gotten my wife and I into like more sustainable fashion. So I got on eBay and I found some like eighties jackets, Zegna jackets that had like basically never been worn. I got one for like $15 and I, f it even has like a tag on the inside of who ordered it, the shop that cut it, like the date on Dang. it was super sick. And then I got it like tailored to fit me and it looks so sick, man. And it's like, okay, cool. Now I have this like Italian suit that, you know, nobody was ever wearing and looks just, you know, close enough to the, the Jerry Lorenzo collab. It's the same brand, same fabric. And I'm like, this, this is a cool journey for me to go on. Like now I know now I've got this like suit. Like I don't wear suits very often, but now I can. Like let's just let's express right. that and see what that's all about. And it's even cooler because it's vintage. Like right. A lot of people aren't wearing that right now. So yeah, that's awesome. I actually love that like vintage shopping is is a big thing now. It seems like all that a lot of the fast fashion stuff is kind of getting pushed out a little bit. And it seems like people are really going into these like vintage stores and finding really good pieces and which is great because I think clothing is like one of the number one polluters in the Big world. Time. Like they don't, they don't break down and yeah, I don't know. I like yeah, I've seen trying to get in, get in into myself. I spent a lot of money on good pieces that I know I'm going to have for a while, but like the vintage shopping looks pretty cool. It's neat. Like, and you can still do that. Like there's still nice vintage stuff, right? Like you can get, and you know, sometimes you save money on it and sometimes it's like, okay, well, I'm just like giving this thing more life, you know? And it's like the kids, the, the Gen Z kids are like big into sustainability. And I think they're yeah. probably like, going to take a lot better care of uh, the world because they know a lot more now earlier than, than, you know, we did when, you know, we were coming up because I don't know, I've gotten the videos on social media too, of like the giant, like wastelands of clothes in Asia and stuff like in rivers and things like that. It's like really bad for the earth. So 
yeah, uh, I'm, I'm. I think it's cool too. Like, plus, like if you put it, you put vintage in front of anything now, like people charge it's it for a, it. So, big so. Well, cool, man. Well, I, I'm glad we got to talk about clothes. I don't get to talk about clothes very much on the podcast. So keep keep doing the work. I see you out there putting in the hours. Keep it up, man. Which, um, but uh, yeah, guys, thank you for listening to this episode. Uh, you can follow Dex on Instagram at Dex Gerald. We'll tag you in the show notes. Anything else that you want to leave the listeners with? But you know, before we go. Uh, you know, just keep doing what you can. I think the biggest thing I learned this summer is that there's always going to be highs and there's always going to be lows, just like our blood sugar. And you got to keep trying to find balance. You can't get too high off the highs. You can't get too low off the lows and keep pushing through and things will work out. Great advice. All right, man. Thank you again for the time. Yeah, no, thanks for having me again.